Let's just stand before the Lord for a moment, shall we? I know you're comfortable sitting just for the moment. Lord, you have some family. What a beautiful family. Thank you, Father, for being so caring to each one of us in this room. Thank you for your great grace upon our lives. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the ability to enjoy life. We thank you for your graciousness at work in our lives. And we just ask that your voice might be heard, that the Spirit himself will speak into us, strengthen us and guide us, and cause us to come up higher, closer to you. Deliver us from anxiety. Deliver us from busyness of mind. Just help us to drink deep from your well. In Jesus' name we ask it. We give you thanks. Amen. You may be seated. Um, I'm going to address you on Psalm 23. And Psalm 23 is about our best friend. It's a hidden truth that's embedded in the text that speaks of a friendship most profound. When I was coming to know the Lord, the song that caught me was what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear, what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. And that was the song or the hymn that caught my soul and has stayed with me ever since. And then Psalm 23, well, you know, you read it in school, you prayed it at times. But there comes a moment when God opens your eyes and you see some beautiful things in the scriptures that you probably have omitted in the busyness of your life. And so I really, there's so many beautiful titles for this Psalm 23. For me, it's my best friend. For everybody else, it's the inc incomparable friend. There's no friend like him. What a friend he is. Amen? You can smile, you look so sober. What a wonderful friend the Lord is. And so when I come to the Psalm 23, I'm going to read to you about it first, the Psalm, in the, in the uh, Passion Version. So you'd love it. I know you, you either love it or you don't, but it's beautiful. And I'm going to read that poetry to you in a few moments. But I want you to allow the Lord to address you deep inside. It's not about what your background is. It's not about what you're going through. It's about how precious you are. The problem is, is you can demean your own self to yourself. And God wants to deliver us from those sort of things. So that we can take one good long look at the best friend you could ever have. Amen? Are you with me? So there are three... Seats here, different colors, different emphasis. And these three seats make a trilogy. Psalm 22, Psalm 23, Psalm 24. And it's somehow amazing how this trilogy is brought together to encapsulate the reason why we have no doubt about who God is and how much God cares. And there's absolutely no excuse whether you're deaf or you're blind or you're dumb. Absolutely no excuse for you to say that you don't know God as your friend. you just got to get yourself humble a bit and search with him with all your heart like that old lady said to me at the age of nine, and you will surely find him. So the trilogy is important. 
because it covers comprehensively in a few verses with all of the hidden nuances just how much God cares for us. That's the point. So you might not just have one wedding ring, you could have three if you like, put into one. I mean, this is a most wonderful covenantal commitment of the best friend you could ever know. Psalm 22, Psalm 23, Psalm 24. So I'll come back to that in a moment, but so that you know that's what those different colors are, different psalms. And if I get tired, I'll sit in one of them, <laughs> emphasize the point of where I'm sitting. So I'm going to read to you from the Passion Version, but the version on the screen will not be the Passion Version. And you'll see the nuances, that's why. You'll see how we can reflect the different nuances in the original languages that help us to encapsulate who he really is. Okay, there you go. Yahweh is my best friend and my shepherd. I've always, I always have more than enough. He offers a resting place for me in his luxurious love. His tracks take me to an oasis of peace near the quiet brook of bliss. That's where he restores and revives my life. He opens before me the right path. That path, by the way, is a circular path. You're going round and up and round and up, and that's how sheep go. And so it's a very interesting path. He's leading them. It seems to be in circles, but really what he's doing is finding the best pasture for them. So his tracks take me to an oasis of peace near the quiet brook of bliss. That's where he restores and revives my life. He opens before me the right path and leads me along in his footsteps of righteousness. There's nobody quite like this friend, is there? So that I can bring honor to his name, even when your path takes me through the valley of deepest darkness. Fear will never conquer me, for you already have. That's quite beautiful, isn't it? You've already conquered me, Lord. Who else can take charge when you're in charge? You've conquered me, Lord. I surrender, I surrender. Right? Stop fighting. Your authority is my strength and my peace. The comfort of your love takes away my fear. I'll never be lonely for you are near. You become my delicious feast. Even when my enemies dare to fight. You anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. You've got to get used to the fragrance of the Holy Spirit, by the way. It's very real. When he draws close to speak to you, you know it's him because no one else quite has that perfume of poetry. The ability to communicate in a few words so much. Does that make sense? So you anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. You give me all I can drink of you until my cup overflows. So, why? Why should I fear the future? Only goodness and tender love pursue me all the days of my life. We've got the photograph, haven't we? Haven't we? Have you got a photograph of every season of your life where the Lord turns up and directs your path and speaks to you? The album is full for those of us who've known the Lord for some time. So why would I fear the future? Only goodness and tender love pursue me all the days of my life. 
And then afterward, when my life is through, I return to your glorious presence to be forever with you. This is considered the pearl of Psalms. Probably known to be the most read psalm in the whole of the Bible because it captures a heartfelt intimacy of relationship that God's always wanted to have with his creation. Wherever you're at, whatever you're going through, take the blinds off. Have a lo long look at how much you are loved. And if you hate yourself, God forgive you. Get yourself sorted. Love yourself because you are loved by your creator. And this is important to us all. So, Psalm 22, very few people read it, it's painful. Psalm 22 is telling us something. I, I, I didn't know I'd have the chairs, so I, I had these colors instead, so there you go. So, um, this should be in the middle then, maybe, then it won't confuse you. Psalm 22, this is about grace. How far is, is God willing to go to rescue you, to rescue me? And when you read the psalm, the language is very interesting in Psalm 22 because the, it, there's only one word I keep saying, it's grace. We don't deserve what God has attained for us. It's the grace of God at work that he should so love us that he sends his only begotten son to take upon himself the agony of soul, the treacherous betrayal of his body by the enemy, and to suffer on your behalf on my behalf, i got to say to you, people don't like to read this psalm, but it's full of grace. We do not deserve what Jesus has done for us, but we're not going to sit and, sit and suck our thumb and feel sorry for ourselves. We're going to get closer to him and say, Lord, you laid down your life for me. And that whole psalm goes through the treachery that goes on. When Jesus is on the cross, it's fully explicit. It's probably got a rating. It's very difficult to read it without feeling the pain and the agony that Jesus is going through. But there are, I think, 31 prophecies fulfilled in this psalm. 31 prophecies in the whole of the Bible that are fulfilled in this psalm to do with the torment, the pain, the grief, the betrayal, the agony of body, soul, and spirit. And those psalms, by the greatest of theologians over centuries, agree it's all wrapped up here in the grace of God. How far do you want God to go to reassure you that he cares. This is the grace of God. Amen. Psalm 23, that's quite interesting. Psalm 23 provides us with just how much he loves us. You say, well, that tells me, no, you're, you're dealing with the exposure of the devil. There's such a person in the universe, the devil. He's cruel, he's mean, he's evil, he has power, he's restricted by God himself. But it shows you when he lets go with all these words like the bulls, when it talks about the bulls, that word plays with different nuances. It's talking with evil violence, the kind of violence that doesn't just shoot you, it rips you apart while you're alive. And there on that 
statement going on to expose what Jesus has to go through. It talks about how they stare at his bones. You've got to go there. If you don't go there, you'll never appreciate how loved you are. But it's all you can see is his bones. Not one of them is broken. In his agony of soul, he's crying out to the Father, his care for his mother, and he's going through all this in your place and in my place. What a wonderful Savior. Amen. Did I hear an amen? amen? But Psalm 23, it's lovely really, it's about guidance. Shepherd, that word shepherd, means intimate protector. Just take those two words, intimate protector. Caring shepherd. The word shepherd mixes up these two words in the original language. It's very beautiful because it's your best friend who's willing to lead you, to guide you, to oversee your life give you the wisdom that you lack, the knowledge that you need, the love that you cannot express without a revelation of his love for you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. Want. Be without what I need to make the journey successful. So what's the first one did we say? Grace. The second one? Pardon? I can't hear you. Why are you so shy? I can't hear a word you're saying. Shout out the words. Well, yes, he's the guide. Through life, both in this and the next. And we can open that up in a moment because I'll finish with Psalm 23. This one is very powerful. It's the glory of God. And the three go together in a most beautiful way because God's never been outside of the suffering heart. God's never a million miles away. He's closer than your breath that you've borrowed from him, by the way. Just know that. I've seen that so many times in hospital when the borrowed breath is taken away. But here is the most profound psalm that talks about the glory of God. And what happens is there's a crescendo in this psalm. And it's one of high praise to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords. The glory of God is revealed. Not only that, you discover that the earth is the Lord's. And all that's within it. People, animals, movement you know nothing about, creatures you've never seen before. He owns the whole world. He owns my life. He owns your life. Whether you love it or not, he owns it. So you see the glory of God. The earth is the Lord's. I don't mind being environmental, but I don't want to be God. It's too big for me. I want to care for what God has entrusted to us. But I don't want to worship nature. I want to worship the glory of God for what he is able to produce in the world that we have. It's a wonderful world, isn't it? Can you smile for a moment because my glasses are fogging up and, and I can't see your faces as easy. This is the goodness of God. There's a little play on words in these psalms. You really need to study it. We haven't got time this morning. You need to study it, but there's a play on words going on in this trilogy. It talks about the birth of a whole generation, and it's hidden in Psalm 22. It's there in the writings expressing why David composed that psalm. And it's telling us that God's got control of the morning, the birth of a whole new generation. I want you to know there's no generation, hear me carefully, 
There's no generation that comes and goes without the intervention of God. If that was not the case, then I don't know how I could have found God. But he turned up when I didn't expect him, I didn't know him. But something in my heart was searching to understand what life was all about. And when he turned up, I will never, ever, ever forget. Because he keeps turning up ever since. And he gives you wisdom that you don't have of your own making. So this is a glorious trilogy. The cross, as ugly, it didn't exist when he wrote this psalm. No one knew what the cross was. Only the Romans, those naughty people, invented the most twisted, painful, torturous machine to pull the bones of a living person apart while they're living. But the description is so clear. And the description of demonic activity, whether it's the bulls, there's several other animals mentioned, but their evil intent exists. But the Lord is greater. Are you hearing me? Of course there's an evil attack. On every generation it comes in different ways. But God is bigger. God is greater. When he turns up, even the buildings shake. I remember introducing Duncan Campbell from the revivals in Scotland. And he didn't say many words, but the few he said were enough to put the fear of God in you. But I remember him explaining when the miners were coming out of the mines and the people were coming out of work and they were falling on their knees in the fields and coming to know Jesus Christ without a Billy Graham. Are you hearing me? God turned up and opened the eyes of the heart. And they saw Jesus. And then they gathered together to pray and as they're praying the presence of God came amongst them and the building started to shake. And he described, I was opening the meeting for him. Everybody else was afraid of him. Very austere. But as he expressed what was going on, you realize God is all-powerful. And God can turn up at a moment's notice and even shake the buildings and get hold of, well, you know, in the 1904 revival when they stopped swearing at the animals and they didn't understand them. You know all that. It's, but here we've got the, the pain that God suffers. You, you have pain? You have pain? God is associated with pain. The greatest pain for him is the loss of one life without the knowledge of him. That's the truth. But he feels your pain. You feel it's awful? Of course it's awful. Pain is not nice. No, unless you're a weirdo. There's nothing nice about pain, but I'm talking about the pain of heart and soul and mind. This is an awful place. And God is there. God is there. He's not outside of your pain. So he's a God of grace. He's a God who can be silent and he's a God who can shout. You don't need him to shout too often. His whisper's loud enough to capture your soul. So the shepherd and his flock have a relationship that de 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 extends beyond the physical realm into the depths of a spiritual journey. There's the picture. Are you, did I lose you then at that moment? Was I muttering to myself that the Lord is with us? He's our shepherd, okay? And the shepherd and his flock have a relationship that extends beyond the meeting of the saints together. He's with us wherever we are. We're on a spiritual journey in a physical body and we have a spirit inside of us. 
And those of us who have found the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and fellowship with him and allow the Holy Spirit into our lives to enable us to walk with him, we'll understand what shepherding is all about. It's what we said earlier, the guide. He'll guide you through every stage, every, every experience. He will never leave you nor forsake you. His rod and his staff will comfort you. This is relationship. Hello? This is not, please be careful of just using the word theology here. This is relationship. That the Lord sticks closer than a brother. And at this stage in our experience, he's our guide. He said when he said to his disciples, it's necessary that I go away. Not because he's failing the task, but because he wants to become more up close and personal by his spirit. Because he's the triune God. And so Yahweh sends the shepherding spirit to be with us whatever we're going through. He's our provider. How many stories we could tell of the miracle of provision. Incredible, isn't it? I wish we had the time to talk about that. The wonderful provisions of God. Insight when you're in the dark. To see things the way he's showing you. It's a wonderful privilege. Very humbling too. But I always have more than enough. Would you say that to the person next to you? Or you can sit by and tell him if you like. But Can you say this back to me? I'll say it to you first. God is my provider, my protector, and my provision. Would you say that back to me? God is my provider, my protector, and my provision. In which way does he provide for you? Pardon? Preach with me because the camera is running. Stand up and shout it out. Okay. Let's all stand before him right now. Come. I want you to think now. I'm going to shout out the word God, the phrase God is my provider. And I want you to shout back to the Lord what he provides for you. Are you ready? So I'll do it first. That's for the camera's sake, by the way. But we're just getting on with God being with us. And the people are going to shout out back. So if you're watching from the camera, hello, wake up, shout back in response to the Lord. I'm going to say it, he's my provider. I want you to shout out in which way is he providing. And you might have to bring more than one thing out of your chest, but just do it. Ready? Amen. The Lord is my provider. Oh, Lord, there's so much provision in this house. Just hit somebody and tell them, the Lord's your provider. Go on, tell them. You may be seated. That's in case you were falling asleep, by the way. But... Now, don't leave the room right now. This is very important. He sees our heads. Hello? He sees our heads. He knows our fears and our struggles. I'm only telling you what God's told me. I said again, he sees our hurts. You can hurt, all right. People can be cruel. Circumstances can be harsh. He sees it. Do you think for one minute that on the cross, 
Jesus in agony of soul for you, for me. Do you think for one minute that the Father didn't turn up? Hello? Do you think that the Father would not be near the Son? He's there. What agony would you have seeing your precious son being crucified, tortured, spat upon, mocked, hated, ridiculed, demonic attacks, one after another, ripping him apart? Do you not think that the father would be a million miles away? No. He's up close, but he's got to go through this to represent you. You say, well, I don't know about all this. Well, what's wrong with you? What's your beef? What else do you want from God? He doesn't have to dirty his hands, but he'll take the clay and he'll shape it. He doesn't have to share his breath, but he breathes through you every day of your life. He's, he's up close. And he's personal, and he takes the pain. Why? Because he's dealing with a vicious, evil lawyer who tries to catch him out. So that if he doesn't do this the right way, there's no hope for humanity. But this is the way. If they only knew what they were doing, he was giving birth to a generation out of crucifixion. And that's what the first title of that psalm talks about. The phrase, you'll see it in your Bible. It'll give you just a little phrase and it's talking about the birth of a whole new generation coming out of suffering. You say you're having a hard time. I get that. I don't know any generation that hasn't had a hard time. But what I do know is the Lord is up close and personal. Don't treat him like a swine. Don't treat him like somebody ugly. He is the lover of the universe. And the truth is, we have no idea of how beautiful the next chapter is. It is way beyond comprehension. Our bodies could not cope with the revelation of how beautiful the next phase of humanity is. Hello? Amen. I have no doubt about that. I've crossed over once. That was enough. And what I saw, I just couldn't get back. He sees our hurts. He knows our fears. And let me tell you this. Some people don't understand this, but anxiety is a form of fear. And if you're anxious, 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 and you're trying to make a decision out of anxiety, you are stupid. You do not ever allow anxiety to direct you. You never ever make your choices based on fear. It's got to have a degree of oxygen in it. Faith. That I believe the Lord is my provider. Right? I heard one amen. amen. He's a lovely God, isn't he? I've got to hurry up because I think it's nearly finished. But, but he sees. He knows. He hears. And he heals. There's so much more you could say. He's a good, good father. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. I, I reflect on my own father. With all of his shortcomings, he was a great ball of fun. And he came to the, he was, he was um, what did I call it now? Uh, uh, music he used to play. Yeah, he was, he, yeah, he was a bit like, our drummer's here, but he was, he was a jazz 
He was a jazz man, right? And when he came to the Lord, it was the most beautiful moment. In a brokenness of heart, he phoned me. And he said, I'm desperate. I said, Dad, here's me, son, talking to Dad. Dad, Jesus is only a prayer away. And he asked the Lord to come into his heart. I became one of our best uh, drummers in worship. Right? But he loved the Lord. Everywhere he went, he would talk to people about the Lord. But the Lord entered into him. Come on now. Give him your best days. Give him your youth. Give him your childhood. It's possible to give him your childhood. Give him what little you have, and you'll be amazed what transformation he will make. He leads me beside still waters, means you don't have to choke on the experience. It's got to be peaceful. When you're drinking, if you don't drink the right way, you'll drown. Right? So he takes the sheep to where they can drink and drink well. But then he anoints my head with oil. This is not unusual for a shepherd. Uh, could, I, could I just take five more minutes? The shepherd, he has a crook. He has a staff and a crook. Correct? So the one with the hook, he uses from experience, if you research it, you'll see, if there's a sheep that's full of lice or infection, he'll hook it, pull it to him, and anoint it with oil to heal its disease, and then push it into the pen. Right? So it's, it's important to know that, that God will get the hook on you sometimes and pull you treat you and speak into you and heal you, right? There's that. But then on this one, he's got a bulbous end. And he carries this, and this is for, because wherever you take the sheep, there's always going to be those who are being preyed upon, the wild animals. The worst one for the sheep is the snake. Because the snake is poisonous and ravenous and it'll choke the oxygen out of you. So the shepherd carries this one, and it's known in, in, in the story of the shepherds in the Near East that they will use this end to smack the snake on the back of their head where all the poison is reserved and knock the poison out of them. Kill them, of course. Because if you don't hit it on the head and crush its head, it'll kill the sheep. The devil's poisonous. He's a liar from the beginning. He stinks. He's so poisonous he can kiss you on one cheek and stab you in the chest at the same time. He's a liar from the beginning. He's the inventor of lies. He is under the cosh. And when Jesus went on the cross, what a shepherd. He might have crushed his heel, the old devil, but he smashed his head in right where the poison is. He limps ever since. So Alan, you're getting too graphic. Well, we don't get graphic enough. I don't know some of the stuff children watch these days. I don't know what graphic is anymore. I'm just telling you, this is very real warfare. But the Lord is our shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, learn how to lie down. Right? He leads you beside still waters. Tell me the other verse. He restores my soul. God knows we need restoring, refreshing, healing. You know that. What else? Pardon? Say again. The paths of righteousness. Wow. Don't be fooled by the culture of the day. There's a lot of unrighteousness in education. There are good people in there too. But there's a lot of stupidity being taught that doesn't figure right. right. But he will lead us 
through the path of righteousness. Right, what's next? For his name's sake, yes, carry on. Ah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we save this for funerals, don't we? But actually, it's not about the funeral. In the darkest of transport of our experience, he's with us. He'll, he'll nudge us, he'll remind us, he'll provoke us, but he'll take us through it. But the focus is not on the dark valley. The dark valley, the ravines, there's a 40 mile ravine, we, we've talked about this, a 40 mile ravine in the Near East where David would be known to have traveled with his sheep. And all of the wild animals were there, dark valley. But it goes on to say what? Your rod and staff will comfort me. And then what does it say next? That's what I want you to get to. He prepares a table. He's very hospitable because this is the big issue now. Even when you walk through death, he's with you. His rod, his staff, everything you need to protect you. You have no fear. Why? Because you're going to have a big notch up in the presence of your enemies. I want you to know this is very important. You don't go into a cold fridge. Your body might be refrigerated or burned. I don't know what. They might dissect it for health reasons, I don't know. That's not the issue. The issue is your soul. And you'll be on a journey you've never been on before. And you'll be up close and personal with the Lord, and your mind will not be on your enemy. Their mind will be on you, because they can't touch you, because you're too busy eating and drinking and feasting and celebrating and doing everything God has taught us to do to enjoy life. Do you hear me? So when we come to that next step, it's not the fear of evil. It's the fun of fellowship and enjoying the hospitality of God in a greater dimension. Okay, I think I've got to stop because I'm getting tired. The greater transition into all that God has prepared for us, who are those who love him, is his embrace. Let's stand before the Lord, shall we? <clears throat> I don't write prayers, but I wrote a prayer. <sighs> no more tears, no more pain, no more loneliness and poverty. This is my prayer on your behalf. O oh God, our Father, our intimate friend, Teach us never to doubt your intimacy and generosity toward us. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the green pastures. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the deep and profound love. It has captured our hearts, indeed. All our lives you have been faithful. We have no reason why we should fear for your intimate presence, your wise whispers into our soul reassures us. Give us not only gratitude, but capture our heart because you are indeed our best friend. And the people said, Amen. Amen. So we're going to sing now with me. No one's got it already, it's okay. Um, all my life you have been faithful. Is there any possibility that the champion at the back of the desk there could actually play that for us? If it's possible, I didn't warn her, but it'd be just nice to, wouldn't it? Uh, or, or did you? Uh, yeah, we'll give you a couple of minutes, it's all right. We've got life. We're breathing, aren't we? You know the one, I was going to sing it out on my own to you, but my wife's not here and she would have told me off. Are you, are you going to lead us or are you Chris? Come on Chris, come and join me. Come on daughter. 
Obey your husband, your father. Come here. Come on, daughter. It doesn't matter, you'll have them in a minute. Caitlin, do you know this song? Anybody else know this song? It's coming in a minute, ready? All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of The goodness of God Here we go